And you, and you, and you, and you were there. Some of it wasn't very nice, but most of it was beautiful. How do, everybody? Hello, hello. Welcome uh, wel- back. Yes, welcome indeed to another, uh, another. I was going to say issue, but <laughs> issues are something we have. Another episode of Dream Idiots. Um, it is episode 31, which I can't believe. That's, uh, again. We are, we're trucking along. We're cook- cooking with gas or something. Well, my dad used to always say that. Now you're cooking with gas. I'm very was, old. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. We've got a couple of stories for you as usual. Brian's going first this time. We hope you've been checking out uh, our various uh, socials and maybe buying a t-shirt or two. I think we still have the Ted Cruz t-shirts up. Interested in those? We do. Cool, cool. Um, yes, and this is this is Dream Idiots, where each week we uh, tell stories to each other about from history, from from the news, and occasionally from our uh, idiotic, ridiculous lives. And we kind of drag your butts along for the ride. And uh, thanks for your comments and your ratings and all those good things that you're doing for us out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and yes, we're on episode 31. And so, um, I am up first, uh, and my question for you is, uh, do you know the difference between a hobo, a tramp and a bum? Hobo, a tramp and a bum. Yes. Um, they are are not the same. It turns out. They are not. Uh, A a hobo is something, is someone who travels is basically an itinerant worker. Someone going somewhere to work. Is that correct? Yes. That's spot on correct. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Tramp, tramp. I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to the other two, but I know that that's how a hobo is different. Yeah, you are absolutely spot on correct. So a hobo is, is a migrant worker. um, Someone who travels, a lot, typically by train, typically illegally by train, uh, and who is someone who is basically always working or also, or always endeavoring to work. Uh, a tramp is someone who is traveling a lot, usually illegally by train, and who's, who is trying to work as little as humanly possible. And a bum is just a, a bum, doesn't travel or work, and is just, you know, I guess is just a, you know, a homeless person, I guess. Um, so I, I didn't know until literally... 72 hours ago that there was this distinction and that i i, I would have kind of interchangeably used hobo bum tra- you know, i would use them all, all the same um and so the hobo lifestyle and that term sort of arose um at the end of the american civil war so you had a lot of military veterans uh folks who were skilled you know obviously it's probably a boatload of folks who had the equivalent of PTSD and who, you know, couldn't probably hand, handle regular employment uh, and who, but they wanted to work. And so um, a, a, many, many Civil War veterans adopted the hobo lifestyle. And so they would hop on a train to Destination X. Uh, and these were folks that that didn't want handouts, didn't want freebies. They wanted to work and they wanted sure. to earn a living, but they had that... I mean, I'm I'm not using these terms appropriately or accurately, but they had, you know, if you're a veteran, there are problems there that cause you to want to, you know, that infuse a level of wanderlust maybe, or who knows what. But by 1911, there were uh, approximately uh, 700,000 people in America leading the, the hobo lifestyle. Wait, one more time, how many? 700,000. 700,000. In 1911. Okay. In 1911. So, so what you've got really is you've got this idea of wanderlust and you said maybe PTSD. So these are folks who maybe got attached to people, especially if you're looking at the civil war, right? You've got this new way of getting across the country, right? The train that's being set up. And then you've got people who really suffered and might've been fighting literally alongside their brothers or cousins or against their brothers or cousin and watching them die. Absolutely. Right. right. So you're, you're not wanting to get too attached to people and places anymore. So you move from place to place. Maybe is what we're talking about. 
Right. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the you know, civil war was hands down the bloodiest, most, you know, nastiest, most awful thing that, I mean, it, it surpasses any other war we've ever been in, in terms of its brutality and its death toll. And, you know, any wound that you, that you suffered during, during the civil war was pretty well deemed fatal because, you know, 1862, what, what was medicine like then? And so uh, it was just awful. And the the death toll from the, from the Civil War was just staggering. So if you were in it, you faced a whole bunch. And so, you know, it makes sense that this this might be the lifestyle you would choose after the fact. So um, hobos, you know, the actual word hobo, the derivation, you know, there are, there, there are several different versions or speculations in terms of where the word actually came from. It could be ho plus boy. It could also be a shortening of homeward bound. The first, you know, first two letters of both those words. Uh, or it could be homeless boy. Or it could be even homeless bohemian. Uh, and then even further, there's a there's speculation that it's a reference to migrant workers from Hoboken, <laughs> Hoboken oh. New, New Jersey. <laughs> but you know, nevertheless, your your definition was was absolutely correct. Itinerant workers who just traveled nonstop, either working or seeking new work. And so, um, a few days ago, I came across this uh, this interesting blurb online referencing the Hobo National Convention. So this was an actual event that happened in 1889. Uh, it took a took a fairly lengthy break during World War uh, One and World War Two, um, but every year there is a Hobo National Convention. It happened just this past weekend in Britt, Iowa. It happens to this day, and hobos really adhere to a certain ethical code. And so, mm -hmm. in the 1889, you've, you've heard of this before. Well, no, no, it just makes sense. You've you've got to kind of do that to get along in that kind of lifestyle, right? I mean. Right, absolutely. And and when I came across this this hobo ethical code, I, you know, I'm not a person who, you know, I'm not religious. I don't subscribe to the bumper stickerization or catchphrases or, I don't know, the edicts or, I don't know, pop culture things that, that pop up that people will try to adopt as their new. I don't know what it, the, the new precept of, of life. I mean, namaste, I, I, namaste, Brian. Yes. Namaste. Yes, exactly. Bro, I grok. I grok. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I know you to be a person who you, you certainly believe in and I, I wouldn't say follow, but you're, you have a certain level of respect for Quakerism and maybe a bit of sort of stoicism. Yes. That would, yes. That would be correct. Yep. Yes. And yes. yes to both. Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, well, hobos, prided themselves on a, a level of self-reliance and a level of um, fairness and honesty and compassion for fellow human beings. And so in 1889, they published at their national convention, the Hobo Ethical Code. And when I read this, I was like, you know oh, what? This, awesome. this, this doesn't suck. This is pretty good. Um, and it was the first thing I'd ever come across like this online where I was like, damn, this, this, is, uh, uh, this speaks to me at least a little bit. Some of the terminology is obviously a little bit antiquated and requires some explanation, but um, if there are 15 rules, I'm going to read, I'm going to read to you and we'll kind of go over them, but this is a pretty interesting approach. Uh, and in my mind feels, you know, like a, like a good approach to life just in general. So this is the hobo, hobo ethical code in order. Number one, decide your own life. Don't let another person run or rule you. Okay, strong start. Uh, number two, when in town, always respect the local law and officials and try to be a gentleman at all times. Fair enough. Okay, yeah. Number, th number three, don't take advantage of someone who is who's in a vulnerable, vulnerable position. Oh, I'm sorry, vulnerable situ situation, locals or other hobos. Number four, always try to find work, even if temporary, and always seek out jobs nobody wants. By doing so, you not only help business along, but ensure employment should you return to that town again. So sort of humility. Uh, number five, when no employment is available, make your own work by using your added talents at crafts. Number six, do not, do not allow yourself to become a stupid drunk and set a bad example for locals' treatment of other hobos. So again, 
look out looking out for your for your fellow fellow hobo um number seven when jungling in town so jungling is basically camping where you know where, where you found to you know, hang your hat while you're in this city um because you're effectively homeless when jungling in town respect handouts do not wear them out another hobo will be coming along who will need them as badly if not worse than you oh okay one per customer kind of thing okay yeah gotcha. exactly right yeah. right uh number eight always respect nature do not leave garbage where you are jungling don't mess with texas <laughs> well the the scouting code of leave things better than how you found it right okay. exactly right if in a, if in a community jungle always pitch in and help great you know being being a good a good steward you know number 10 try to stay clean and boil up wherever possible boil up sanitize i guess it's just you know just speaking to general cleanliness i think sure hot water yeah get some right, hot yeah. water on your face <laughs> and your body. yeah exactly okay. uh when traveling ride your train respectfully take no personal chances because because no problems with the cause no problems with the operating crew or host railroad act like an extra crew member yep fair enough you know but again just be responsible um number 12 do not cause problems in a train yard another hobo will be coming along who will need passage through that yard you know, same thing as, as, as above, basically, you know, you're, you know, you're not leaving your life alone. There are others who will, uh, who will, who will be harmed if you act up basically. Uh, number 13, I was kind of blown away. This was in there considering the year this was written. Number 13, do not allow other hobos to molest children, expose all molesters to authorities. They are the worst garbage to infest any society wow okay yeah fair enough <laughs> no no complaints there uh number 14 help all runaway children and try to induce them to return home wow yeah okay <laughs> yeah good enough yeah 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 easy to easy to, to support that one and finally number 15 help your fellow hobos whenever and wherever needed you may need their help someday sign me up that's a that's a good <laughs> those are good rules for life yeah i mean all i mean way, so, so yeah so go down the list and exchange the word hobo for people and so done done i, I will assign initial <laughs> to whatever I, done done and done well and you see a lot of these precepts in a lot of the and a lot of i don't want to say organized religions but do thine own self be true be right. good to your neighbors render unto caesar what is caesar's you know and unto god what is god obey the local laws that kind of thing right and we again, want a picture not a belly itcher no that's not yeah. <laughs> uh help out your fellow travelers uh because you never know when you're going to need that kind of help i mean that's that's a good that's a good lesson of, of living right there yeah so I, I was sort of you know blown away by its simplicity and um it just seems to it just works really really well and that was from what year again 1890 let me scroll back 1889 wow so yeah 130 years 133 years ago and you kind of see that ethos in in you know popular rep representations too um which is interesting when you get into like Frank Capra movies and so forth, you kind of get into that, mm -hmm. that mindset. Um, did you get anything on, did you see anything about the hobo sign markers? No. What's that? Well, it's this, you can look, you can look these up and they're great, but basically it's a series of signs that hobos would leave by carving them with a knife or leaving them, or maybe smudging it with like uh, if you had a pen or maybe with, you know, ash or something. And it's a symbol that they use to give each other, to let each other know, Hey, you can go here for work. Like they'll smudge a post by a house with oh, a well, certain, okay. with a yeah, certain, yeah, yeah. With a certain symbol. I don't right. remember any of them, but another one might say, you know, there might be a warning. Do not try to get work here. Just uh -huh. a way to help each other out as you're moving through the town. Like, Hey, you can get a meal in exchange for, you know, cutting logs at this lady's house or, Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the cops are, you know, there's, there's a, there's a sign that was like uh, friendly, 
friendly law enforcement or something like that that would let them know yeah this down right. there, there might be an exit says just keep moving you know don't, don't even bother stopping here just <laughs> right, move right. on through that is that's fascinating stuff right i i, yeah, I never I, knew I was, about this this code yeah i was sort of you know, blown, blown away by that and, and then further blown away but you know this group still meets <laughs> so. yeah and is it the same place every year or is it yeah yeah brit iowa b-r-i-t-t Last weekend was it was it was just held. Well, it makes sense. It would be in the center of the country, right? I mean, where everybody can come in from. Right. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the only um, I, I mentioned this only because the um, I'd like uh, I like the name. There are there are noted hobos. It's, it, 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 I saw on um, uh, Wikipedia, I think. Uh, Jack London was a was a hobo at one point. Oh, I could see and, that, yeah. And there was a, there's a singer and the kind of erstwhile, you know, farm worker union person, a, a guy named Utah Phillips, who I have heard of. Oh, before. sure, yeah, 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 I've heard of um, Utah Phillips. And yeah. I can't, I, I forget, I, I can't think now what the reference was, but I liked the name Utah Phillips because I know there's a time in your life where your where your nickname was Utah, so I thought I'd throw in Utah Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, if you call the reprobates I used to play poker and hearts with, uh, uh-huh. yes, that's, that's who gave me that. <laughs> hey, hey, Joe, I know you're listening. Um, <laughs> yes, Johnny Utah, that was me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a fascinating look at you know, and, and when you think about the way it's been represented in in film and television, just to get that difference between those that terminology, uh, Harbo, Tramp, and 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 bum. Um, right. Yeah, and, and I imagine there would be some, I don't want to say infighting, but I wonder if there was an attempt to like proselytize in a way of turning, trying to turn a tramp into a hobo. It's like, no, come, come, you know, live. I would just wonder. That oh, would sure. be interesting, it'd be interesting to look at. Very oh, I'm cool. sure. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, there you have it. The, the, awesome. The, the, church, the church of Hobo or Great. I don't know. Something. Great job. No, that that's awesome. We need to post that on the website. I think the hobo code. That's uh, <laughs> the hobo that's code. What, what's it called? The hobo code of ethics. Code of ethics. Hobo code of ethics. Yeah, uh, awesome. I found I found that on um, openculture.com. But then if you if you Google it, um, it's sort of like it's a little bit obscure because I, I I found it somewhere online randomly. I think on Facebook, and then there are a whole bunch of references that that were posted earlier this year, but nothing prior to that, seemingly, or very little prior to that. Uh, and so there are all these little um, online news you know, gathering, th- you know, sites that post stuff and they all posted earlier this year and, but I'm not quite sure why. So there you have it. Very some, cool, some good, Brian. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah, what, uh, uh, <laughs> what, what do we have next? Or do we have, we a, have do a, we have an appropriate? Well, not really curse word, word but, but here you go. One second. It's time for the dream idiots curse word of the week. Not so much a curse word, but this was a, a kind of a news item that I came across that I thought was just too um, too ridiculous not to share. From um, Atlas Obscura, which is a, a, a newsletter I sub- mm-hmm. um, subscribe to. So, it's good stuff, uh, yeah. It's random, hilarious, interesting things from history. So 17, 1785, there was a book published, and there is a, an original print of this book in the British Library. Uh, the title of this book is A Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. It's <laughs> written by a guy named Francis Gross. I think it's <laughs> G- G-R-O-S-E. It could be Grossy, oh. I guess. <laughs> G-R-O-S-E. Um, and <clears throat> so this book came out, you know, 1785, came out shortly after. So Samuel Johnson was was the man who published the original, or, or the, probably the first in sort of modern times, uh, first dictionary of the English language. And so the only two, in, in this context, when you talk about the vulgar, t- t- vulgar tongue, the vulgar tongue, vulgar terms were basically any language that was used by kind of the commoners, poor folks. It isn't just... Things that are vulgar aren't necessarily crass or curse words, but they're vulgar just because the average commoner or poor poor person used vulgar language. And so that's sort of the differentiation between vulgar language versus the English language. Vulgar terminology was sort of its own language, so it, so it sort of mandated its own book. And so um, this guy, Francis Gross, 
you know, published in 1785, this first book, A Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, is published in 1785, and it was so popular, it was reprinted again in 1788, and then again in 1796, <laughs> because it was so, uh, it was used, you know, used a lot, um, just inhaled by, by folks. And so this book includes the first reference to screwing as sex, uh, right. it, reference, it references in print kick the bucket for the first time <laughs> um, and just because this is dream idiots and because we have to include this it references the term cheeser for the first time it's got to be a fart it's a fart yeah okay all right <laughs> um, some other <sighs> no, some other notable exa- <laughs> mm-hmm. examples sorry heavy sigh from Morris um, to dance upon nothing is to dance an, upon nothing. Uh huh. To dance upon nothing is an expression that <laughs> that means state of drunkenness. Ah, no, that's a good guess. Oh. Means to be hanged. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> that's not uh, close at all. No, <laughs> no, no. But good, good. Still, still a good guess. Um, Gross. Gross was a, he was a military man apparently, um, and he was probably Church of England, um, but to kind of took a jab at Jesuits, and so there's a term in this book called to box the jesuit and to to box the jesuit is a term for masturbation <laughs> because as gross uh, is quoted as saying it's it's much practiced by the reverend fathers of that society so fuck you jesuits um and then my my personal favorite and and you won't guess this but like i'll give you a chance to, to try an admiral of the narrow seas. What do you suppose that is? Uh, someone with a uh, a narrow urethra. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. An admiral of the narrow seas is someone who drunkenly vomits into the lap of the person sitting opposite them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in that case, (laughs) so there you have it. Classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue. And so early, earlier today, before recording this, I actually ordered two copies because you can order. There's there's, there's a pocket version of the vulgar dictionary. (laughs) Um, And because I love I love ordering used books, especially on Amazon and other places. I have ordered two (laughs) copies of the pocket version of this book by Francis Gross. And I actually shipped one straight to you and one to me. So you, you, you have a package coming. I shall keep it on my person at all times. That is yes, uh, yes. that is magnificent. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> if it feels like this is like the spirit animal of Dream Idiot. So, um, and I, I was going to you know go suggest that you know, anyone out there, if you want to you know email in to Dream Idiots Podcast at Gmail, like I don't know, the first five people, if you send me your name and your and your mailing address, I will send you a copy, a pocket copy of the Vulgar Dictionary, if you really want one. That so is Dream awesome, Idiot, Dream Idiots Podcast at Gmail. The first, the first five we get in after the listening first, to this first episode. five, yeah. Okay, I, I, most. I mean, I, I bet we don't even get five because, but, but you know, just because I don't want, I, I don't want to say everyone that, that emails in because something will get in a bunch. But um, it's definitely a, a worthy read. No, no, I was listening all along from episode one. <laughs> Long time listener, first time prize getter, first time farter. Wait, wait, wait. first time cheeser. There you go. Uh, Speaking of cheese, let's uh, let's go back to the movies, Brian, shall we? Oh, right, here we go. Let's all go to the movies part four. Movies I should have walked out of. Last time I told you the tale of four films that I walked out of for one reason or another. This time, this time it's for real. Let's start with 1989. Brian, do you remember a film called January Man? I do. I did not see it. I know Kevin Klein is in it. I know it was mocked mercilessly and and I think justifiably because it was just fucking terrible. I saw this with two of our <laughs> fellow uh, writers, uh, uh, Ross and uh-huh. Ross and Mike, uh-huh. basically on the basically on writing Kevin Klein's coattails after winning Best Supporting Actor for Fish Called Wanda. Okay, uh, Klein, I remember because Ross called me that night because I, I said, ah, Klein's not going to win. They're not going to give it to somebody for a comedy. And Ross called and rubbed it in my face. Uh, I told you, I told you he was going to win. So we got together and let's go see January Man, directed by Pat O'Connor, 1989. Now just listen to this list of, of performers here. Kevin Klein, 
Check. Check. Right? Great actor. Like Kevin right. Klein. Okay. Right. Alan Rickman. Awesome. Very good. Yes. Okay. Susan Sarandon. Heard of her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Danny A. Yellow. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Mm hmm. Okay. All good so far. Harvey Keitel. Mm hmm. And, and Rod Rubens. Steiger. Or Rod no, Steiger. No Paul Rubin. Rod Steiger. <laughs> Yeah, okay. There's there's a few Academy Awards floating around in there. Yeah, right? four. Steiner, at least. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I came up with three off the top of my head, but I I don't know how accurate that is. Um, so that's a pretty good cast. That's a pretty big cast. I could not wait to get out of this film, and I <laughs> I, I sat there, and I don't know if it was because it was cropped incorrectly, and they had it projecting at the wrong angle or what, but you could see boom mics all through this thing. Uh, it was ridiculous. And I remember we, all three of us walked out of there and there's this general sense of like, what the hell did we just watch? What was that supposed to be? Was it supposed to be a comedy or a mystery? Uh, critics respond. On Rotten Tomatoes, the critics give it uh, 24%, which is not good. <laughs> and the audience is slightly higher at 29%. Here's what some of those critics said. <clears throat> Betsy Bosdick, and Betsy, I'm, I apologize if I've pronounced your name incorrectly, Bosdick from dvdjournal.com said, this star-studded schizophrenic movie can't decide whether it's a thriller or a quirky comedy, so it bounces back and forth, and the result is a stilted, nearly unwatchable mess. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Kathy Burke from United Press International. This film sits out to be large, dramatic, and powerful, as well as endearing, and misses on every point. From RogerEbert.com, the great Roger Ebert. <laughs> How in a thousand years was this casting ever decided upon? Who <laughs> believed Rod Steiger and Harvey Keitel belonged in the same scenes? Nothing fits. Every role seems to have been faxed in from a different movie. Faxed in. I love that touch. <laughs> and the actors are in such various planes of emotional intensity that sometimes you catch them right there on the screen looking at each other in bewilderment. <laughs> <laughs> and he closes out with, see this movie if you must. I have never revisited this film. <clears throat> but I sat through the whole thing. Let's talk about a Rob Reiner film called North from 1994. You ever heard of uh -huh. this movie? I have, okay. yeah. I saw this with friend of the pod, Jack, and another fellow high schoolian that went to school with us. Although I don't think he was there when you were there. Yeah, you were gone by the time because he was, yeah. Uh, in the middle of the movie, we were like, hey, should we leave? Should we come on? There's no one else here. No one's going to know if we leave. We right. stayed for the whole thing. Um, directed mm. by Rob Reiner, appearing in 1994. This uh, this film featured Elijah Wood. Mm -hmm. I knew that. Jack, Kathy Bates. Yep. Academy. Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Damn. Emmy winner, I believe. Good. Yep. J Jason Alexander. Mm -hmm. John Lovitz this yeah. kind of seems like the mm, film okay. he might be in Dan Aykroyd was in this okay you don't like Dan Aykroyd? Mm, so so. <laughs> Bruce Willis was in this yeah. okay yeah he, he's sort of my kryptonite but go ahead okay well I know you'll like this one Alan Arkin was in this movie I, I'd love me some Arkin so critics respond <laughs> 14 14 from rotten tomato critics 27 percent from the audience jeff andrew from Time Out. reiner is undecided just how fantastically he should treat this ludicrous plot line added to which there's a dire musical number a silly thriller subplot and much maudlin didacticism from narrator willis in various guardian angel disguises and his last word is misery <laughs> Michael Wilmington from the Chicago Tribune <laughs> said, it's a prime example of what can happen when hip, slightly cynical establishment filmmakers try to make a deeply sentimental movie. <laughs> and this may be my favorite Rod uh, Roger Ebert review of all time. North is one of the most unpleasant, contrived, artificial cloying experiences I've had at the movies. <laughs> To call it manipulative would be inaccurate, as it has an ambition to manipulate, but fails. <laughs> I hated this movie. Hated, 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 hated this movie. Hated it. 
hated every simpering, stupid, vacant, audience insulting moment of it, hated the sensibility that thought anyone would like it, hated the implied insult to the audience by its belief that anyone would be entertained by it. <laughs> North is a bad film, one of the worst movies ever made. But it is not by a bad filmmaker and must represent some sort of lapse from which Rob Reiner will recover, possibly sooner than I will. Uh, Skip ahead to 1995. I was, uh, I remember seeing this because I was, when I moved to Salt Lake City to go to graduate school, I was seeing a lot of movies, most of them by myself. And I saw Fargo by myself. Oh, Love Fargo. Love Fargo. I, yeah. I saw um, Usual Suspects, a film I really like. I saw that by myself. Absolutely. Right. So I thought, eh, it's time to get together some of my new graduate school friends and let's go see a movie together. We saw <laughs> Pout. We saw Powder. Do you ever? Do you remember this film? Well, I'm I'm fairly certain that Powder and Mask are the same fil- same film. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Directed by Victor uh, Slava in in uh, in 1995. I might be saying that wrong. It might be Salva, actually. Um, this stars Jeff Goldblum. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Sean terrible. Patrick Sean Patrick Flannery. Oscar winner Mary Steenburgen is in this. Mm-hmm. Lance Henriksen is in this. Oh, he's I, actually I love him. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah. he's good and everything. He's the kind of performer that kind of ticks everything up at least a half star. Right. Right. Turns a three and a half star movie into a four star movie. So I saw this a couple of fellow graduate students at, at my insistence. After this, I was not allowed to pick the group movies for a while. <laughs> now the critics, were, the critics were slightly, um, slightly more, fifty percent from Rotten Tomatoes, sixty nine percent from the audience. I just remember this being the kind of film that made me feel vaguely uncomfortable, and then particularly uncomfortable, and I really didn't know why. Here's what some critics said. From the moviereport.com, Michael DeKenya said, pretentious, uninvolving head scratcher that aims to be tragic and uplifting and falls way short. The only thing it'll lift is your butt from your seat midway through the film. (laughs) Mike Clark of USA Today. Performed to the hilt by Flannery and filmed with conviction by Victor Salva, the movie is finally too solemn to survive its pushy musical strings. It's not too bad. Let's see what Roger Ebert had to say about it. <clears throat> RogerEbert.com. Powder has all of the elements of a successful fantasy and none of its insights. It's a movie where intriguing ideas lie there on the screen, jumbled and unrealized. It leads up to bathos, not pathos, because not enough attention was paid to the underlying truth of the characters. They're all just pawns for the plot gimmicks. Powder, and this is a film that's about a young, hairless albino boy who has strange, strange abilities particularly of the electrical variety. Powder himself comes across as a cross between Cliff Robertson's Charlie, the Elephant Man, Mr. Spock, E.T., and Jesus. He is wise beyond his years, has great compassion and insight, suffers much, and attracts intolerance and meanness. I suspect that Powder was at one stage an interesting project, but then, I'm only guessing here, the production process led to a dumbing down of the material until the movie was faced with a paradox it could never explain. How could anyone as smart as Powder have a problem with the morons in this movie? (laughs) The sad thing is that when movies like this fail, and here's the part that really, uh, this is a real stinger. uh, When movies like this fail, executives think that proves there's no audience for unusual original pictures because they think they've made one. Um, And here's maybe why I was so uncomfortable. Something truly gross. Right as the time this movie is released, um, it was revealed that director Victor Salva had been convicted of sexual misconduct after his 1989 debut film, Clown House. And uh, his victim was one of the child actors of the film, a 12 year old at the time. He was also found in possession of commercial child pornography. He was sentenced to three years, served 15 months and completed parole by 1992. He's also known for the horror movies, Jeeper Creepers, which I just cannot bring myself to watch. And I I remember after I saw Powder, that story broke, and I was like, oh, maybe that's the uncomfortableness I was feeling while watching this film. How did he only get three years for that? I I don't know, but this victim and his family led a a boycott of the film, which 
Yeah. And, and you know who distributed this? Buena Vista, which is Disney. So oh, <laughs> Disney. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the final film on my list is one that's probably going to surprise some people. Uh, Robert Rodriguez is 19. Uh, I'm sorry. 2005 adaptation of the Frank Miller graphic novels, Sin City. It's a comic book movie, which right. you would think I'd be all over. It really should be right up your alley, right? Um, among many people who are in this film, Jessica Alba, Mickey Rourke, Bruce Willis, Elijah Wood, they show up again, Josh Harnett, Rosario Dawson. And the original uh, Sin City comic is, is really an astonishing use of black and white. It's, it's very stark. It's very uh, film noirish. It's very It's a crime-oriented comic. It's also super gross in places. And what this basically was, was a shot for shot remake of a lot of the comic lines. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it wasn't great. I'm saying it's exactly what probably most people wanted. But halfway through, I really wanted to leave. There was something <laughs> about the, the motion of it, the connected motion of it. The story. I just felt gross while I was watching it. Now, I saw this with a friend that I met through my wife. He was a colleague of hers in New York. He was a doctor. And uh, I really wanted to leave, but did not. And I did not know that he wanted to leave as well, but <laughs> we, we were two of, oh man, I don't want to sit through the rest of this, but I don't want to make myself look like a wimp in front of this guy. So I guess I'll stay. Um, critics respond 77% of critics like it wow. on Rotten Tomatoes, 78% of the audience likes it. Here's a few, uh, here's a few responses that kind of are more in line with what I was trying to say. Trevor Johnson of Time Out says, while the book succeeded in pushing the boundaries of its medium, the film merely feels like a triumph of technology. Uh, And that's from Time Out. David Walsh of the World Socialist website says, Sin City is a witless entrant in the porno sadism category. (laughs) Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. From the Wall Street Journal, Joe Morgenstern says, while Sin City on screen evokes the same feeling of bottomless decadence and dread that the novels do, there's one crucial difference. You can put the novels down. <laughs> so I think one of the reasons I've fallen into this trap, and you and I have seen a few movies together. I, I was going to throw in a couple of other movies that I should have walked out of with our good buddy Joe, but I realized that Joe deserves his own let's all go to the movies. Oh, just with yeah, Joe alone. Yeah, good call, right. um, so I know Joe listens to this usually, uh, he usually uh, binges three or four episodes. So uh, there will be a, a, an entirely Joe related story on let's all go to the movies. But I think one of the reasons that I, I didn't walk out of certain films was because of the company I was with, that I didn't want to right. give up on this movie that we'd invested with as you know, people that I saw movies with a lot, uh, Mike and Ross and Jack. And then I get to this film uh, that, and then wanting to impress new people, like my new graduate school friends and this friend of my wife's, this coworker of my wife's. And I felt just the pressure to sit there through a film (laughs) that I did not really want to watch. Mm -hmm. Has that ever happened to you? Um, Yeah, a couple couple times come to mind. I was in some art house theater. It, uh, you know, I should probably see it again. It's it, it, you know, it's been a million years. Like Water for Chocolate was a was a. I think it's in, I don't know, definitely in subtitles. In, in it's a French film, I think. Uh, I actually won Academy Awards. I was you know, I, uh, I couldn't even now tell you who I was with. I saw it in Dallas for some reason. It's like why the fuck am i here is, <laughs> I, 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 I would rather be doing literally almost anything over this uh just dreadful um you know i'm sure there there have been you know other other films that i've, I've seen most of the um robert rodriguez films i've seen i can't name a single film of his i think i think is even halfway decent like you know once upon a time in mexico saw that in a the theater that, i mean Parts of it were a little bit amusing, but it, it's almost like um, he's a toddler making movies. It's, oh, yeah, he did a good job considering he's a toddler. You know, like it, it just seems like, yeah, this is not good. Really, really so, not good. One of the films I saw, one of the films I saw when I was in Utah was From Dust Till Dawn. Yeah, terrible. Just and, not, not good. Oh, I liked it. Um, but the funny part is it was a double date and I knew what the movie was about. Uh-huh. And the, the woman in the other couple knew what it was about. 
but our dates did not know what did it was I? about. Uh-huh. And so as soon as the big twist comes halfway through the movie, I hear the guy at the end of the the guy at the end of the, the row go, What the fuck did I just see? <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, and, and again, I, I kind of uh, yeah, you know, I want to say that all of these films, North included, are better than any film I've ever made. Um, I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum, but I think I've also reached the point where I know what I like and what I want to see. And yeah, I'm willing to try something different and something new, but I spent a long time like, because I'll go to see a movie if it's an art house movie. Yeah, I'll give it a go if it's a, you know, I'm really into like the superhero movies and that kind of stuff. I'll go see that. The fun part is where you bring people to an from an art house culture into a mass produced film mm-hmm. and vice versa. Because some of the films that I've seen with people where they're like, like I, I remember seeing uh, Six Degrees of Separation with uh, which I enjoyed. And it was very it was, it was very much like a stage play, which it was based on. But it's Donald Sutherland, Stuckard Channing, uh, I mean, Will Smith, right, right. good performers. And the people I saw it with just absolutely hated it. Like, it wasn't that bad. I mean, um, sure, it was already farty, but that was kind of the that was kind of the point. Anyway, um, yeah. So those are four movies that I should have walked out of, but didn't. And I will have some more of these down the line, including uh, some that I really shouldn't have gone to with Joe. So I'll get Excellent. to those in a later nice. date. A, a, a series that just keeps on giving. It, it really does. It really does. Um, all right. Well, thanks for listening, folks. Thanks for checking out the Dream Idiots. And uh, we will be back next week with more wackiness. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.